I was born, much like any other baby, but I was not born alone. The tumor had grown with my spine, as if we had somehow become good friends from conception. But what kind of friend threatens to destroy you, to eat away at you, to control and cripple you? At three months old, the neurosurgeon planned to remove the tumor. To my mother, I was a typical three-month-old with no deficits. She began to wonder if surgery was really necessary. With the exception of the tennis ball-sized lump on my back, I appeared normal and my legs and feet worked perfectly. The impression that my parents got from the neurosurgeon was that the tumor would be removed and all would be well. But everything that could go wrong did. Spinal fluid started leaking within 24 hours and my back ballooned. They tried an abdominal binder with no luck. At the end of the week, it became apparent that I would not be leaving the hospital. They took me back to surgery to repair the leak twice, and both failed. Finally, after three weeks, they put an external shunt in my head, and the pressure was kept low enough for the wound to heal. During the four weeks I was hospitalized, I contracted sepsis and almost endured the journey of death. But I eventually went home. When I started to stand at about 12 months, my parents noticed that my left foot would roll over and cause me to bear weight on my ankle. My mother mentioned it to my pediatrician, but he wasn't too impressed. He recommended those high ankle baby shoes. My parents tried that for a little while and it didn't change anything. My mother asked for a follow-up appointment with the neurosurgeon, the one who had told my parents that everything would be normal after the tumor was removed. What the surgeon failed to tell my parents, however, was that they could only remove the bulk of the tumor, but not all of it, because the tumor had formed at the same time that I had. It distorted the spinal nerves, and since no case is exactly the same, no two patients will have the same symptoms. At this point, I was starting to walk on the side of my foot, and the skin was breaking down, so they had to do something, hence the first of many tendon transfers in leg orthotics. Tendon transfers move a tendon from its normal point of anchorage to another with the goal of correcting foot deformity and creating a braceable foot with maximally preserved range of motion. But with the tendons of my feet now severed, I would require leg orthotics to stand and to walk, not just temporarily, but for the rest of my life. Most of my childhood was spent in and out of hospitals. I grew used to the taste and smell of them. I felt safe there. And honestly, it felt more like home than most places. There, doctors attempted to fix me, stitch by stitch, until I was something of a science experiment. As time passed, of course, I became more understanding of my differences and limitations. I would see myself in the reflective windows of buildings, forced to acknowledge that my gait was abnormal. But regardless, I felt I possessed the intelligence and ingenuity needed to fix it. I begged the doctors to fix me, it was in those times that I began to rely more on doctors to help fix whatever it was I began to hate about myself. I'd allowed these adults for so long to have their way with me. I gave them my trust, my body, all with the hope that they would indeed make me like the other little girls at school, but they never did. When I was four, my parents signed me up for weekly ballet lessons. And despite the leg orthotics, I was convinced that I was no different. I looked at the other ballerinas in awe as they leapt and twirled, not thinking anything of the fact that I could not replicate their grace, not with my leg orthotics fusing my ankles at 90 degree angles. I didn't have the tendons required to jump. I was like a bird trying to fly with clipped wings. 
Despite this, I did my best and always proudly declared that I was indeed a ballerina. Years later, I would go up to the snowy mountains to ski with my father and sister. There, in a sense, I was taught to fly. On skis, I felt free somehow, unlimited. The ski boots were like my leg orthotics, fused at a 90 degree angle. And so it was as if the other skiers were equally as disabled walking around on land, most of them tripping and walking on their heels. In contrast, up on the slopes, we were equally free. I loved the adrenaline and the thrill. I loved the fluttering snow and the chill of the wind. Those days on the slopes were equivalent to my dreams at night, the ones where I could run and defy gravity. Yes, I fell many times, but I stood up again and again, laughing it off before searching for my skis amongst the snowbanks. Seeing the wheelchair now, no one would guess that I am the same girl who sped past them on the ski trail all those years ago. Even I have trouble realizing that that girl was indeed me. Feels as though we were cut from the same cloth, but sewn together separately. I forget often that we are one being, I simply a matured version. Biking was another activity that provided no limitation. I didn't need to bend my ankles to work the pedals. And so just as with skiing, I enjoyed the thrill of speeding around, going above and beyond what my legs could do on their own accord. For years, it became routine for me to go out biking as soon as I came home from school. I breathlessly watched the seasons change, learned the patterns of my neighbors, and experienced wild situations and adventures. For those times, I'm utterly grateful. My legs continued to give me the gift of freedom, but with the expectation that I would also be willing to lose that gift in time. As I grew taller and my spine lengthened, the scar tissue from my first surgery did too. The tissue was like a ship's anchor, tugging on my nerves, warping and distorting them. With time, my gait grew wilder and my balance worsened. Because of my nerve damage and tendon transfers, I could not walk without leg orthotics. But unable to bend my ankles, my body was forced to adapt. And so I began to walk, but not like others would. I bore almost all of my weight on my heels, jamming them down with every step. With this, my leg braces would create sores on my feet. And to everyone's frustration, the left heel never wanted to close, no matter how they adjusted the brace. My mother began the discussion of amputation, hoping that there would be more freedom in my mobility and an absence of the endless flesh wounds that plagued me. Years later, however, my prosthetist came up with a genius brace design that offset the weight on my heel. The orthotic gripped me just below the knee so that all my weight poured there rather than my feet, or in my case, my heels. The brace not only provided more stability, but it allowed my foot to be spared of wounds and pressure sores. With this new brace, however, I lost my ability to upright ski and to bike. I traded one freedom for another. It kept me out of the hospital, but it kept me from the things that made me feel limitless. By the age of 15, we could no longer ignore how much wilder my gait seemed, how much more limited I was becoming. My spine was trying to grow, but the scar tissue, like sticky tar, was playing a game of tug of war. I fell often, tripped like it was a habit, and walked like it was a chore. My balance became so bad that my mother called me Weebles, just like the children's toy. Weebles wobble, but they don't fall down, she would jokingly tell me as I flailed my arms and grabbed the nearest piece of furniture. Finally unable to pretend that they weren't failing me as a patient, the doctor sent me to a neurologist. Dr. K came to be another soldier fighting this new battle the one directed to save my spine, to reverse whatever catastrophe had festered beneath that 15-year-old incision. Although encouraged not to form a personal relationship with a patient, he did. I was a young girl with a sarcastic wit and a smile that refused to fade. I suppose that emotional connection helped me to hold on for as long as I did. On August 30th, 2012, he untethered my spine and sewed me back up, each stitch knitted into my flesh. I lay completely naked for seven hours on an operating table with a tube jammed down my throat in front of dozens of people who pricked me with needles and cut me with scalpels. I handed them my trust and relinquished my need to be in control. For the price of being free, I let them hurt me. I practically paid them to do it. 
This major spinal operation tested my courage, my resilience, and my tolerance. Things went horribly wrong. I could not sit up without my head filling with insurmountable pressure to the point that I needed to lie back down to relieve it. There was so much pain throughout my body. I was chock full of pain meds lying in the intensive care unit, believing that I would heal and turn into this beautiful butterfly. I convinced myself that I was going to walk the same way as others. I put myself through so much suffering simply because I wanted Ren to forgive those doctors, to look back and smile and not be so angry. I was indeed searching for the version of Ren who saw no evil and who believed in a merciful God. But to my displeasure, she would grow lost in the pain and the hopelessness. I lost Ren. She withered away like the flowers do when nobody bothers to love them anymore. By living the bitterness of life, she embraced the ease of dying, the simplicity of just letting go. She lost her will. When my back ballooned with leaked spinal fluid, it was just the beginning of a long journey wherein I lost Ren. When there is a leak, the spinal pressure is off and the patient can't sit up without the most intense headache filling their cranium. And only by lying down would it disappear. I had a backpack full of fluid which caused me to look pregnant, but from the back. And yet believing it would go away on its own, they let me go home. My spine refused to fully heal. I could not sit up, I could not sleep, and I could not live. The teachers at school sent me my homework, and I did it because it was the only thing left I could fully control. When I was not studying, I was getting call after call from their neurology office. Dr. K, with a heavy heart, decided to go back in, a choice I willingly embraced because it would seal the leak, or so I told myself. As before, the leak would just not seal, but again they sent me home hoping my body would heal in time. And so I lay writhing in pain in the backseat of the car on the way home after a brutal hospital stay, full of physical torment, lack of sleep, and disappointment. Dr. K used industrial glue, stitches, everything to try closing it, almost like a plumber trying to repair a leaky faucet. But within days of the surgery, my back slowly began to fill with fluid again. To stabilize the pressure in my head, I wore a medical corset. It only did so much. I could walk, but a lot of my mobility during those grueling eight months was with the assistance of a walker. Dr. K tried surgically repairing the leak two more times with no success. Reparative surgery number five of this ordeal would be the final and most agonizing. Tired of cutting open my back, Dr. K considered putting a shunt in my head. The shunt would take the excess fluid pooling in my back and move it elsewhere where it could be reabsorbed by the body. It would balance the pressure in my head and allow my spine the opportunity to heal the leak once and for all. They shaved part of my head, sliced open my scalp, and put the device beneath the skin. Then, they fed the little tube just below the skin of my neck, over my collarbone, my ribs, and to a place centered on my abdomen. There, they cut me open again to secure the end so that the fluid would be moved to this part of the body and reabsorbed. The pain when I woke up was almost 10 times worse than that of any of the previous surgeries. My head was so much more sensitive. I was miserable, pressing the morphine drip dispenser, as if asking for death. In April of 2013, just around my 16th birthday, my back began to heal after eight months of agony. The headaches dissipated and my back was flat. At this point, we were not visiting Dr. K at all. He told us to leave it up to time, to call if anything worsened. In a couple weeks, we had an appointment with him, and so we waited to tell him of the great news. On that day, my mother wanted to play a prank on him by having me wear the corset and fill it with stuff so that it looked as though I still had a fluid pocket on my back. We were just so happy to finally be coming to the end of this ordeal after eight long months. Not seeing the humor would have been utterly shameful. And so we went to his office, his gaze immediately moving to view my bulging back, his eyes nearly watering, and his voice shaking as he spoke. He began to tell us that he had given up, that there was nothing more that he could do for me. I kept smiling, nodding, and nearly laughing. He seemed angry that I was happy about him admitting that he had failed me. 
Finally, no longer able to handle it, I tore the corset off, allowed the contents inside to spill out, and turned to show him my flat back. He laughed so hard, hugged me, and called in the nurses to see the prank that I had played. It was one of the most beautiful moments of my life. We shared that beauty with a man who was trying to save me, as if he were trying to save his own child. And he did. He saved me. That summer, I met Boris, the giant Great Dane service dog who would be trained to be my cane. In a way, he would help me to learn to walk again after so many months of being bound to a walker and to give me back the freedom I still craved. I continued to struggle with curbs, stairs without railings, and rocky terrain even after all the surgery I had gone through to recapture such mobility. The surgery ultimately was a success. I got back more sensation in my thighs, regained better balance, and now had a completely flat back with all the remaining fatty tissue from my initial tumor removed. My confidence skyrocketed. Boris was an incredible aid in my healing. He was tall, patient, and strong, kind of like most people's dream man. I leaned on him as I walked, and with him, I suppose I felt freer than I had in so long. When I fell, he braced himself to help me back up, to use him as a table. For over a year, Boris freed me of myself and gave me back the liberation I felt I had lost. In him was a piece of Ren, a piece that wanted nothing more than to move on. I still remember the exact moment that I knew I was again losing my mobility. February 10th, 2015, I was walking my normal path through the hallways of the school. With no rhyme or reason, my legs gave out and I fell to my knees. I had journeyed the same hall just the day before at record speed, but now I was trapped on the floor, unable to find the strength to stand up. For 10 minutes, my legs felt numb, paralyzed, as if they were suddenly not a part of me any longer. Somehow I managed to get to my feet, but felt so weak in my legs that I nearly fell with every step. It was one of the scariest moments of my life. I was not in control of my body. I was gripping Boris with both hands, taking each step as if expecting to fall back down to the ground. I made it to the elevator that would take me right to my class, but I was so exhausted that I thought I would not have the strength to take the ten steps between the elevator and my seat. This was the beginning of the end all over. Unable to walk it myself, I was forced to use a standard hospital wheelchair for the long distances between classes, at least until the customized one I had ordered for college would arrive. In that time, we went back to Dr. K, made to acknowledge that something was not right. Through two separate MRIs, it would seem the problems of my last surgery may have never been fixed to begin with. We were so concentrated on just healing the leak that we failed to realize that my brain was being pulled down through the base of my skull. No one had ever truly understood why the first attempt two years ago failed to fix this. I had relapsed, much like a cancer patient years after remission. I had to decide to embark on yet another uncertain journey, or to simply accept my physicality as it was. On June 11, 2015, Amidst the sudden explosion of final exams, high school graduation, and senior class trips, I once again embraced another scar. This one would involve the placement of a new shunt near my spine. The tube would then be fed through my body to join my other shunt. That same incision would be sliced open, and to my dismay, a new one would mark my upper back and side, parts of me untouched by a scalpel for 18 years. Post-surgery, my symptoms morphed into something new every day. One day it would be intense headaches, then ceaseless vomiting, then light sensitivity, and then hatred for all food. This chronic condition was slowly killing me day by day, as a prisoner of my own body, living on 300 calories, maybe even less. Time was such a cruel game. The unknown was even crueler, and possibly the worst of any fate ever handed to me. Vomiting and headaches became a daily occurrence, and when I imagined it couldn't get any worse, fluid began to fill my back pushing the skin out like a backpack being pumped with liquid. The incision on my side, too, began to bulge. Both would fluctuate each day, and the one on my back became painful the more it filled, pressing against my spine and my healing incision simultaneously, causing me complete agony. Months later, the fluid finally dissipated, and the leak healed. This was around the time I relied on my wheelchair more and more. With it, I felt free. 
I fought it for so long, and yet it made me feel normal for the first time in so long. The fear of falling to the floor dissipated, replaced with the thrill of not having a speed limit. I could still walk, and I did, but not with confidence or vigor. My balance was poor, and to be honest, I was tired of my body being a burden. Not to others, but to me. The simplicity of just moving across the room without access thought or grit breathed new life into me. The wheelchair gave me hope, and I suppose that's what I really craved at the time. Boris was quick to learn to pull my wheelchair, and for five years he continued to pull me across college campuses, graduations, and life events. He was a part of me. He was my liberator, my savior, my best friend. And then one day, on a sunny April morning, I held Boris in my arms as he said goodbye. My world went cold. I couldn't remember who I was without him. He had been a part of my identity for seven years. People always saw him first, always asked about him and not the disability. He allowed me to hide the parts of myself that I was not proud of. He was my partner in crime, my son, my world. And no words can ever begin to express how much he meant to me or how much he gave. These days, I use my wheelchair, but I push it on my own. I walk, but I use my walking frame, and not as often as some would expect. It isn't always practical to walk around, especially when trying to carry things in your hand, go far distances, or control a finicky bladder. Given that it takes 200 muscles to take a single step forward, the best option is often to speed around in my wheelchair. It is safer and faster, and I feel more confident. I still do yoga, stationary biking, rock climbing, and seated aerobics, but I am definitely nowhere near the level of mobility I had from birth up until the age of about 12. I used to run around all summer long with my friends, swim, ski, dance, and skip rope just like any other child would. I remember that girl so well. I wish I could hug her and assure her that she would grow up to be happy, brilliant, and able. I wish I could thank her for her strength, her resilience, and her wisdom that she passed on to me. I'm not sure who I would be today without them. As for my beautiful Wren, that part of myself that I lost along the way, wherever you are, I hope that you find the courage to come home, to trust humanity one more time. But no matter what, I hope that you know that I have never stopped searching. I will find you, and I will take you home, okay? You hold on. Just hold on.